in the late 1930s, the regiment uh, was only parading or training 10 days a year. They would fire on the ranges uh, once a year. Uh, they knew their gas drills. Some guys were uh, being trained in specific trades like communications. These guys are learning Morse code. Some were, were serving in the militia at the time uh, for a sense of duty, but coming out of the, uh, the Depression, some guys were doing it um, for the money as well. So by 1939, they had a lot of making up to do. In 1940, once they've been given the word to mobilize, um, they start recruiting heavily. There's images of lineups uh, in the St. Catharines Armory of men eager to, to enlist in the active force. In terms of aptitude, you had guys leaving school um, to to enlist in the army, uh, so guys with grade 9, 10 educations, some even with less. Uh, other guys uh, you had who were successful businessmen, successful lawyers, university graduates. So I mean you had men uh, from all walks of life uh, in the regiment. They were looking at about three to four hundred soldiers to fill the battalion. And it was filled very quickly. It was filled within a matter of months. Um, by the time they had moved to Camp Niagara to begin uh, more active training, they were already at a full strength battalion. The original uh, battalion really was still wearing World War I uniforms, using Ross rifles, wearing World War I webbing. Uh, it wasn't really until later in 1940 that they're starting to be equipped with mod or for the time, modern uniforms and modern, I mean, modern rifles. A lot of their training uh, was done throughout Niagara and the Lake, uh, done on the rifle ranges, which still exist today. So familiarization with their weapons, their Lee Enfield, uh, their Bren guns, their Lewis machine guns, uh, mortars, things like that. A lot of them were actually really keen to go overseas. Um, especially for the first contingents in the regiment, I mean, they were all volunteers. Conscription wasn't even a thought. Uh, they had volunteered to, to go overseas and fight. As they're being shipped around Canada training, there's guys who are concerned that they're not gonna actually get overseas and fight. Um, it's not until late 1942, uh, or sorry, 1943, when the regiment finally gets shipped over to England and put into uh, the 10th Infantry Brigade as part of the 4th Canadian Armored Division that they now know they have a spot in the active army. They are going to go overseas and, or cross the channel and fight through uh, Europe. Ontario Infantry Unit prepares for an assault on the ferry landing island of Capel Severe. Used by the enemy for frequent attacks on the 1st Canadian Army, it presents a serious threat to operations. So the regiment itself uh, in early 1945 in January um, is charged with taking a small island called Capel Severe. Even the North American canoe becomes an instrument of war in Canadian hands. Canoe commandos form one arm of the double-pronged drive on the... Uh, and the regiment suffers about 60% casualties just on the first day alone. Uh, the battle rages on for another five or four, four more days. Um, and after this battle, everything was seen... It was a dividing point for the regiment. Um, everything was seen either before Kapelsvier or after. So after Kapelsvier, they really see a new regiment um, new guys from all over Canada. Um, and after Kapelschwer, they continued the drive into the Rhineland and then ultimately into Germany. The regiment was really a family for these men, uh, a second family. They had experienced things with their comrades and their peers that they would never be able to experience with, with, uh, with some of the other people in their lives. Uh, these were guys that shared foxholes, shared rations, uh, kept each other safe. Um, so there was that bond. Mm -hmm. 